So let, let's try to keep the questions uh, short and the uh, and, and and relative and the answers as well relatively to the point. Could I just begin though, and then I'll take some questions. And Lord Natalie, one of the things that really intrigues me, particularly being away from Australia for a long time and being of Indigenous background as well, is the why we still have this division so entrenched between what is ethnic media and what is mainstream media. And, and why is it mainstream media providing a voice and an, and an avenue and a vehicle for ethnic media to make a point when there is, why is there not just greater representation in mainstream media of, of ethnic voices and ethnic writers? You do see it in some of the world's great newspapers. You, you certainly see it with the rise of uh, organisations like Al Jazeera, CNN, where I was at. There was such a range of diversity there that uh, you just don't see here. Um, to switch on television, it's predominant, not just predominantly white, but blonde and white. Um, a ABC, the ABC to this day has not had an Indigenous person, well, I, I left 15, 20 years ago, I was working in Canberra as a political reporter, but save that, not an Indigenous report, reporter on Four Corners, no Indigenous person presenting one of the high profile mainstream programs, not one Indigenous person as a foreign correspondent. This is an organisation that's been bringing Indigenous people into their, into the body of the ABC for more than 20 years and, and they are continually funnelled into Indigenous broadcasting. I, I'm just wondering why we still have that division uh, and when will we see a greater diversity and not people brought across just to report on Indigenous affairs or ethnic affairs if they happen to be ethnic or Indigenous, but to bring that, that world view and those experiences across a whole range of areas, whatever uh, the area of re ex reporting expertise may be. I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I, it is, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. I mean, you could talk about that with any media organisation, I think. Um, uh, ours is just the same. We have had a range of reporters come and go, but the, the, there's very few of them that uh, represent the whole community. Uh, I guess you'd have to look at, um, you know, what, who are we recruiting and why and how. Um, it is, I mean, it is difficult also to get across um, the message for every community in one um, publication. Um, so, I mean, if you look at our newspapers, the Sydney Morning Herald, the Sun Herald, uh, usually we will have um, an ethnic type story, maybe once a week or, or more often than that, but it's a matter of time and space and competing news stories. And unfortunately, it depends on the audience of your newspaper. When you've got big stories of the day happening, they, you know, you have to make choices about what you put in the newspaper and how much room you have. And sometimes, you know, I've got some of the best stories I think ever, and they don't make it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah. But unfortunately, I don't think there is a one particular reason or one formula that you could just say would fix it. Mm. Uh, questions? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. My name is Munir. I have a question for the Natalie. Natalie, thank you very much. You mentioned a couple of uh, your contacts with the ethnic media, and you said they're supporting you. And it stands said uh, no representation for the ethnic community in mainstream media. The same question is, like you mentioned it, but you have to start. The mainstream media have to start. We have a very good relation. Whenever the mainstream media, any of the journalists contact to us, we are more than happy to provide the, all the information they're looking for. Mm -hmm. But when we contact to them for any information, it never comes up. The big issue is mainstream media never realize the importance of the uh, ethnic media. So what the, the mainstream media has to start it to build the relation. As you said, uh, whenever you contact with some of the stories regarding for the direct people of the ethnic community, they said they've been burned so many times. So it's happened uh, in a uh, mainstream media. They, they don't give the right information, right uh, uh, stories to the mainstream. So mainstream media has to start working with the eth ethnic media. And what do you say about that? Oh, I agree. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's exactly right. We have to reach out, um, and that's what I try to do. Um, and so if you've got any issues, come and see me. I'll give you my card after. <laughs> you can call me. <laughs> but yeah, I, look, I think you're right too. I think probably some ethnic media have contacted the mainstream and just got the brush off. I, you know, I, I, I'm sure that has happened. 
Um, I mean, I encourage my colleagues as much as I can to make um, contact with the ethnic media, but still, um, it is only me at, at my newspaper that does a lot of that. Uh, but I am happy for anyone to call me if I can help. But it is up to us, I know. Question here? The microphone just in the third row. Um, hi, a question to primarily Natalie, but I'm happy to <laughs> Natalie's in the firing panel. line here. Yeah. Oh no, she's not in the firing <laughs> squad, she's, in, she's on guard. <laughs> um, no, it, it sounds like what we've, what we've been talking about is, is two simple things. One is, this isn't about ethnic into mainstream or mainstream acknowledging ethnic. It's about the transformation of media in Australia. That's and it's about right. what is going to happen and what are we prepared to give up, share and take a new stance at? Because it's not about who has the place. As The question I'm asking is, is this actually a point where we really are at a crossroads and we're really looking at transforming media? Because I often think about what gets on the front page and we never struggle for the bad news stories when it relates to ethnic communities. But I'm still struggling 20 years into my own career to get a good news story on the front page of a newspaper. It's about transformation, about the cultural change and really looking at the embedded institutionalised racism that exists in the media. And let's name it for what it is. It's not a bad word. It's about recognising it. And I think, uh, Jerry, you alluded to that this morning, how critical that was. So I guess the question is, are we really looking at media cultural change here? Or are we really looking at just topping up and trying to find a little bit of equality, which really isn't the outcome, I think, of most of the people here? Well, I think, I think we are looking at cultural change. That's what we have to face. There's no question about it. Um, and if we are to survive, that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah. It's a pretty simple answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, can I just ask a question of Wanning and then take another one from the floor? Wanning, um, one of the interesting things you know, I've observed talking to a lot of my colleagues when I was working in China, Chinese colleagues for Chinese organisations, um, that they were certainly aware of how hamstrung they were with censorship and, and government control. But there were also philosophical differences. On the one hand, we are very conflict-driven in, in our media coverage, uh, and we are very crisis-driven. I think if I can say broadly, amongst the Chinese that I spoke to over there, they were very interested in outcomes. Uh, not necessarily the argument, but what the outcome may be. So while there was a heavy hand of censorship, the way they've responded to that is to report very much about how things can be improved. Ours is about, let's tear it all down and have an argument and then see what's left. Um, is, is that something that you've found? And how does that then translate into the teaching of journalism to the next generation of reporters? Uh, I think, Stan, you've really, um, really hit the spot uh, with the differences between the way the journalism is practiced here and the journalism practiced in China. The differences can have both a political factor and a cultural factor. G uh, political factor simply for the fact that you have a two party system. I mean, not to more than two party, but you've got really have a binary mm. political system going on here. So uh, objectivity understood in a very simplistic way is uh, give them equal spa air space or giving them equal uh, lens of time. So in that case, you, that objectivity means um, both sides of the story and hence you need conflict, you need, you need that kind of differences to make up the kind of drama, that kind of, you know, without the, that kind of conflict you don't have a story. That's part of the news value that's intrinsic to that. But whereas in China, politically you can't do this. Uh, you have one party rule anyway and you can't actually uh, you can't really uh, cover what's behind the closed door. There's a lot of struggle, power struggle there, much more than mm. you ever imagined. Mm. Right? But you never get to hear it. What you get to hear unless, it is unless you're Bo Shi Lai. He, he, yes. he found out very quickly. Uh, then look at what happened <laughs> exactly. with Bo Shi Lai's uh, uh, news about him. Look yeah. what happened to Chris Buckley, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so the fact is that you can only uh, tell the con consequences and outcome, and it's always, always a happy one. But it's, you know, you never debate the policy. It's only the policy when it's announced to you that you get to know. Right, that's the political reason. The cultural reason is that, you know, it's like um, politics is a bit like sports. P sports is binary too: win, mm. lose, loser, win. Right, in a, in the sense that journalists here in this this country are trained, are programmed to report the story in that kind of a uh, um, uh, sort of. Uh, a binary kind of way, and whereas in China they have a different kind of understanding of 
professional journal. What it means to be professional is quite different, mm. right? Objectivity is not understood in the way that it's understood here. In fact, objectivity is not necessarily the goal to strive for. It's something else, right? Maybe it's the, stri- if it's the balance between the need to tra- toe the party line on one hand and on the other hand, manage to get across as much information as possible that is useful to the reading public. Mm. Right. It's a, and it's very much driven by what the outcome will be. That's know. right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think also, though, I must say that when they are given the chance to go off, slip off the leash, occasionally when the party says it's open season on something or other, they go at it very, very yeah. viciously. <laughs> uh, they can be very, very savage yeah. indeed. Yeah. Um, we may have time for one more. One more question from the floor. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, no, I was just saying that um, basically what Natalie was saying uh, was very, very courageous to come out and say what you're saying. It's very idealistic, but from my experience in working with a lot of mainstream media uh, through writing MuslimBelief.com, covering a lot of the stories that involve the Muslim and the Arab community, is that one thing that sort of drives everything in the mainstream media, and let's just be blunt about it, it's about selling advertising. And it comes down to what stories can generate the most... Um, form of page hits or sell the most newspapers. So there's a dimension of social consciousness or social responsibility that's always missing. And even I know I've met it and I've seen it in a lot of journalists and, and you know, then they'll pass the buck and say, it's my editor that's doing it, it's not me, I feel bad. But, but how do you think as an industry that's so money driven at the end of the day, it's really what, what counts. A lot of the times, unfortunately, how can we improve the impact of having social responsibility especially amongst uh, new journalists and existing journalists, to factor in the way that they report uh, things. Can, can you sell social responsibility? <laughs> That's it, in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that is, I mean, that is a difficult thing. Uh, I mean, social responsibility lies with each of us, I think. And as we were talking about earlier, you have to make decisions about stories that you're writing. You have to think about the impacts and the ramifications. Is it worth it? Um, what what's going to be the outcome of a story? Is it something that's worth creating a stir because it needs to be? They are all personal decisions, I think. Um, editors also look at that as well. Um, but it is very difficult to, for everybody to have, in an organisation, to have the same social conscience or the same ideals. And I guess that's the problem. Um, the people see newspapers through a particular lens. Um, we may have a range of people on our newspaper that give a, a whole lot of different views, um, but they may not have those same sort of thoughts. And it's, we can't marshal everybody into the same way of thinking. That's a problem. Uh, I mean, I try to... Um, with I've written about the Muslim community from many different perspectives for a long time, from the children overboard incident to terrorism, organised crime, um, through to social problems. It, for me, it's been quite a journey, learning about everybody um, in different ways and having to think about all those things. And for me, um, I do have to think about um, the social aspects of it because I'm a career journalist. Mm. I'm going to walk back into the same community I write about every single day. I have to think, my contact, the one thing is I may have written controversial stories and I may have written some things that people don't like, but the thing is, if I have a contact in the community, I never burn them and no one will ever say that I have because I think about what impact it has for them. Talking to me, I I do think about the things that I write about and how they are going to affect the people I know, my friends, this community, um, and the community at large, which doesn't mean I shy away from some of them. Sometimes I ignore stories because I think this, this is going to not do anybody any good. How do you make that happen? Well, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's well, difficult to answer for it, others. It's isn't a it? very difficult yeah. thing. I mean, I wish we could run ethics classes. <laughs> you know, I mean, we probably can, but are people going to stick by it? Mm. All we can do is promote it amongst our colleagues, talk about it, put it on the agenda 
and try and pass on those values. I mean, I do when I try and mentor younger journalists, but really, I guess, you know, it's the problem of the world. We have to address it in some way, and each person has to do their own, I guess. Natalie, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. I, I think what, one of the interesting things, too, that Natalie pointed out, and uh, the transformation of social media and the proliferation of social media means that a lot of organisations these days uh, are becoming a lot closer to their readerships in, in plural than they are to their advertisers. And when Natalie talked about the future of mainstream media and how to monetize that, really, ultimately, what social media is saying is if you're not reflecting, in the broadest sense, what we are saying, then you will go under. And the most successful organisations today, be they financial publications, sporting publications, political publications, or whatever the world over, uh, or, or even television networks the world over, are the ones that are responsive directly to the people, even, and then the advertising comes after that. So I think we are seeing a transformation. The transformation is driven by the connection to the people, even beyond uh, the connection to the advertising dollar. So it's going to be a process, but I think we're seeing that in, uh, you know, underway at the moment. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you so much to our, our guests as well. <laughs>